This podcast contains discussions of child abuse, sexual repression and sexual abuse, suicide, racism, misogyny, PTSD and PTSD symptoms, and spiritual oppression and abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, we will be mentioning some of these concepts in a general way without any graphic detail. If any of these topics or other triggering topics will be mentioned in great detail, we will let you know at the beginning of each individual episode, as well as in the show notes for that episode. Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast. We are your hosts. My name is Gavriel Ha Cohen, and I am here with my BFF and co-host Sadie Carpenter. How you doing today, Sadie? I am really tired, but I am doing great. If you're listening to this episode on release day, it is my 29th birthday. So please wish me a happy birthday and send me presents. Oh yeah. Happy, happy, happy birthday. Thank you. So for your birthday, we're going to talk about extremely dark topics. That's what we do. Um, Actually, the day that we're recording this is the day after we release the John Todd episode. And this is heavily related to that in a lot of ways. But like the response that we got to that one was incredible. People really, really loved it. The John Todd episode. I'm so happy that people loved it because it was probably one of my favorite episodes ever to do the research for. That one was really fun. So today we're going to dig one level deeper and look at one place where John John Todd very possibly could have gotten his ideas about the Illuminati. And when I say very possibly, I mean almost certainly did, because what he had to say is so similar to the document we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, um, I'm so glad that we finally get to talk about this. I'm Like you said, I'm glad that our listeners really like it. You know, I, I think that a lot of conspiracies, they function in the same way as cult. The brain science stuff, the psychology behind it is very similar to cult stuff. So if people really want to see that kind of content in the future, we can do more of it, I think. We enjoy doing it. I enjoy doing it. Yeah, I think there is a lot to get into there. More more than that, even what we're talking about today is what I would describe as the original source material for like almost everything, right? like for the satanic panic, for QAnon, for the Holocaust, for like a shockingly large number of beliefs held not just by the religious right in this country, but, you know, beliefs that so many people, I mean, and maybe even people who are listening to this beliefs that they hold that you know that they don't even know about that they don't even know where it comes from this is like the pivotal link between like all of those like how how would you describe it so i would say that conspiracy theories are probably as old as humanity but this one marks a major change in how they function because this is where conspiracy theories go from small scale things that might have consumed a town or a country like the um the salem witch trials consumed an area of what is now the united states but it didn't spread that hysteria didn't spread around the entire world at the same time it was localized this is where that changes and and where conspiracy theories can become world changing mass delusions that spread on a national or international scale so in a way this is a precursor to every modern conspiracy theory from the relatively benign to the extremely harmful, even stuff like JFK assassination theories or moon landing conspiracy theories, because the way that it spread and the reach that it had changed the way that conspiracy theories in general work. As far as specific things that come from this, the satanic panic and QAnon both have definite roots in this conspiracy theory. Yeah. You know how when you learn about the hero's journey, 
Like, you know about, the, like, the monomyth, the, the hero's journey. I do, because you explained it to me when we were bored early pandemic. Really? Yes, you went on a very, very long text chain. Oh, I don't remember that, but okay. Um, well, but you know how when you hear like when you learn about the hero's journey, like it's it's like a, a the hero's cycle as, it, as it's also called, and then you go back and you watch Star Wars, or you go back and you watch The Lion King, or you read Harry Potter, and you see, oh, this is the hero's journey. This is that monomyth. Or like, say you were going to go and watch every episode of The Simpsons, and then you listen back to all the episodes of this podcast so that you can find all the Simpsons references. Yeah, once you're looking for a thing, you see it pop up everywhere this is that but for like you know teachings in christian fundamentalism in conspiracy theory in populist politics we are of course talking about the anti-semitic conspiracy theory known as the protocols of the elders of zion uh, which is a conspiracy theory alleging a jewish plot for world domination some of you have heard of it maybe you won't have heard of it maybe you won't have seen things from this by the end of this episode mark my words you will see blood libel literally everywhere but before we get into that the leaving eden podcast is the podcast mainly about my bff and co-host sadie carpenter's life in and escape from the independent fundamental baptist cult we talk about this cult we talk about other cults we talk about religion we talk about fundamentalism we talk about the real and present threat that cults and cult ideologies pose to society as a whole and it is our goal to promote freedom of mind freedom of thought and freedom of religion so if you like our show if you are a fan of our show there are some things that you can do you can join our patreon for an extended and uncensored versions of most of the episodes you can join our facebook group which is facebook.com slash groups slash eden exodus i think it just ticked over we have 1700 members in that group a lot of people posting memes posting you know personal stories and stuff it's great we have a subreddit which i think has a thousand members now anything else i'm forgetting oh um we're doing pride month stories again yes Please send us your, uh, if you are uh, an LGBTQ person and you have a story uh, that you want us to read on the podcast uh, that you would like us to share, make sure that you send it to us at leavingedenpod at gmail.com. Make sure you uh, include your name or if you don't want to use us to use your name for uh, whatever reason, a, a different name or just say anonymous or whatever, make sure that you include your pronouns so that we can refer to you respectfully. Yeah, any story, positive stories, <laughs> negative stories, whatever it is that you would like to have read on the podcast, any story about your LGBT experience in the IFB or another high control group, we want to center your voices for Pride Month and we're hoping we'll get enough to open and close the episodes with a story. I think the only other thing is Faith Promise Missions tier patrons. Absolutely. So our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons, you guys are the ones that really keep the lights on for us. Uh, and so we really appreciate you. Uh, we have Andrew Rocant, Brittany, Carrie R., Crystal Patterson, Eleanor Donahue, Emery Fairlosser, the OG Emery Fairlosser, Hope Norum. Oh, new new one right here. Jen Kacharski, Jessica Tambo, Tambo like Rambo, Kater Wee, Catherine Schneider, Kathleen Moncrief, Kristen Marie, Linda Morgan, Lorena Watson, Madeline Cusick, Mary Martin, the uh, original uh, actress who played Peter Pan on Broadway, I assume. Uh, we have not heard otherwise, so we're just assuming that's true. We can neither confirm nor deny. Great way to put it. Megan Arndt, Rachel Bernadowitz, Rebecca Hoyt, Sadie's actual BFF Morgan, Sarah Reese, Shane Horton, and as always, to close it out, Wes the Cowboy, what it do, buckaroo? Thank you so much to all of our patrons who support our show, but a special thank you to all of our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons. Yes, 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 absolutely. So what are we talking about today? What we're talking about today, uh, some of you know it, some of you don't. A document called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, also sometimes known as the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. Anyway, it's a fraudulent document. It is a 
fabricated document. It is it is fake. It is a hoax, 100% a hoax, but it purports to be a document written by the Jews detailing step-by-step instructions and plans for world domination. This document originated in the Russian Empire in 1903. It was written in Russian originally, but the general idea is that the Jews are planning on using Marxism, liberalism, and crony capitalism combined with control over the media and considerable financial resources to corrupt governments, bend businesses and public officials to their will, indoctrinate people with propaganda in order to become their pawns, and after a long enough time, this corrupting influence will be worldwide and universal, and then they will consolidate power and dominate the world uh, under a one-world government. If this sounds familiar to you, it's because this is almost exactly a cut and paste job from the conspiracy theory uh, alleged by John Todd that we talked about a few weeks ago. So like there's a few differences, but there is a direct line that goes from the protocols of the elders of Zion to John Todd, a direct line that goes from protocols to satanic panic and a direct line from that to QAnon. Yeah, his theory is so similar to this that I don't see any way that it wasn't heavily influenced by the protocols. I want to make it clear that we know that this is a forgery, number one, because of logic, because what group of people that has a nefarious plan to take over the world would write down that plan? Also, that that has like Dr. Evil inventing the laser energy. Oh, God, I forgot. Rothschild space laser. But also, we know that this is a forgery because it was plagiarized from several other political works. About 160 passages were directly lifted and lightly paraphrased from a book called The Dialogue in Hell Between Machiavelli and Montesquieu. How do you say that? Montesquieu. Montesquieu? Yeah. It's a it's a coded that book is a coded political satire from 1800s France by Maurice Jolie. And if you go to the Wikipedia page for the protocols, you can see this side by side from quotes from that book and quotes from the protocols. And you can see how they are the same. It's plagiarized. There are plenty of passages that are copied from other political works as well. A lot of them had to do with the French Revolution. Yeah, it's kind of like a queen versus vanilla ice situation. So the protocols began to be published in sometime between 1903 and 1905 in Russia. And by 1921, they were already exposed as being plagiarized. But that didn't stop a lot of people from believing them and using them as a reason to commit absolutely horrible atrocities in the world. This conspiracy was a critical influence on Adolf Hitler because he believed that this document was authentic. And his campaign to commit genocide, which resulted in the murder of six million Jews in Europe, can at least be partially traced back to the protocols of the elders of Zion. And while so we're going to talk about that partially, we're also going to talk about the links that this document has to the IFB and the links that this document has to Christian fundamentalism. Um, So maybe just a little warning. Our listeners know that Sadie's a bit of a leftist, right? That's that's fair a to bit. say, right? Yeah, a, a bit. Um, in, Por- in Portland, I'm moderate, but in the rest of the country, I'm like wildly far left. <laughs> yes, uh, that's how it is here. They, like You also may have noticed that I personally tend to be skeptical of most ideologies in general, not as like trying to be like a constant like naysayer and that sort of thing, but just that I'm often skeptical of ideologies because I think a lot of them can result in black and white thinking. Um, This document right here, the protocols, is part of the reason why I gravitate towards that particular worldview, because I think in large part, most ideologies take at least some level of influence from the conspiracies alleged in this document. So if maybe during this episode, I come across as particularly keen to 
draw connections between this text and uh, leftist populists in particular, it's because those points are maybe not as outwardly apparent as the connections between uh, like fundamentalism or, or like QAnon conspiracies. But because like even if they're less outwardly apparent, I still think that they're worth pointing out. I'm not pointing them out because I think that like leftists as a whole believe the whole of the, this conspiracy. I'm pointing it out because I think it's good for people to I, I'm not just I wouldn't say like just challenge the narrative that they're presented with because a lot of times the narratives that you're presented with are actually right and accurate, but to like examine the components of those beliefs and and see where individual opponents of those lines of thinking may have originated from. I, I think that that runs together really well with the idea of faith deconstruction because. A lot of us who come out of the IFB or come out of another high control group have entire parts of our worldview that we realize are built on a foundation of lies or a foundation of twisted truth. And that entire bit of our worldview that is built on that has to be taken down. The thing is that that doesn't mean that throwing away the whole thing is the right I, is the right move for us personally. Absolutely. Like me, like I um, d- dismantled and deconstructed everything that I believed about religion. Well, I'm still in the process of doing that because I, I don't know if that process ever ends. But for me, throwing away religion wasn't the right thing to do. For some people, it was. It was the correct move for them. For me, it wasn't. So I think when we, if we notice that one of our ideologies is built on the foundation of lies that comes from this document or another lie, it doesn't mean that the end result of our thinking must be thrown away. It means that we have to take the whole thing down and start over again. And reevaluate every piece of it on the basis of is this true or not. Yeah. And I mean, that's a decision that you have to make for yourself. It's not like something that I'm going to go on the internet and say anybody who thinks that who thinks this also believes this and therefore they're. Well, because that's kind of an ideology. That's a generalization. (laughs) Yeah, that is a, a generalization. And I don't I often I I mean, I don't I won't say I've never engaged in that before, but you know, I, I think it's generally a bad idea to. I don't want it to seem like I'm just trying to use this to like slander political figures that I don't like. This, it's a complicated topic, but I think we're going to handle it. So the basis of the protocols and the reason that we keep referencing John Todd is that this document takes a lot of negative stereotypes about Jews. And just like we were talking about John Todd doing to the, you know, the Satanists and the witches and all that, it takes everything the intended reader dislikes or fears, lumps it all together, and then blames it on a group of people who the intended reader dislikes or fears. And in this case, it does that by depending on literally every negative stereotype you've ever heard about Jewish people ever. Yeah. And I mean, that's basically how a lot of populism works is that they're like, everything that you hate is blamable on one, on this group of people, this small group of people. Yeah. And I feel like, I feel like I have to resist that as a person who's very politically leftist because (laughs) I think the temptation is to take everything that I don't like and blame it on conservatives. That's oversimplistic. And that's not um, that's not always the correct answer. I mean, often it's the correct answer. (laughs) <laughs> sometimes but it, but it, I'm it not saying, really sometimes it is I'm not but saying it's never the correct answer. <laughs> like the destruction of, of of women's rights over their own bodies in this country is pretty clearly blamable on conservatives yeah but uh, but fair. not every not every issue that we have is that simple and i think it's it's very easy like i've talked about before um deconstruction is the hard road it's easier to not challenge all those beliefs it's easier to take every problem that you don't like and blame it on a group of people that you don't like it's so much more comfortable than trying to take it apart piece by piece so anyway we got to get to those stereotypes um the stereotypes about jews are generally what, what are they? They're like, we're greedy. We only look out for each other uh, and our own communities uh, to the detriment of other communities. Let's see. We're smart, but we use our intelligence to be sneaky and manipulative to compensate for our physical weakness. Let's see. Oh, we're rich and we control all of the world's finances and we use this wealth to buy political influence rather than helping people. And we are a corrupting force because we do not accept uh, Jesus because we killed Jesus. So that's 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 basically it. 
that's if that's you most hate, of them yeah if you hate the jews that's probably why so i am i swear i'm not going to derail this episode <laughs> with the whole jews killed jesus thing but i just want to say that it makes me furious as a christian that is not the point the, number one theologically no one killed jesus jesus was divine and was a, unable to be killed by human hands without his own consent he gave up the ghost so if anybody killed jesus jesus killed jesus the idea is that his own people were content with sending him to death if he had been american it would have been american sending him to death the whole point is that it was his own people that turned on him not that it was the jewish people that turned on him it, it's when you blame when, when the the jews killed jesus rhetoric makes me so angry because it misses so many theological points that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> we, uh we have plans to do an episode where we talk about the like who killed jesus where we like talk about that but earlier you mentioned the blood libel which is the stereotype that has maybe gotten the most people killed out of all of them could you define blood libel just for anyone who might not be aware okay yeah so a blood libel is a false or libelous accusation of heinous or demonic behavior by jews that is made to provoke an often violent response against said jews so the medieval example of this is the accusation uh, made by various christian communities throughout europe that jews were using the blood of christian babies as an ingredient in their Passover matzah, and that they were using it for uh, demonic rituals. So blood refers to the alleged Christian baby blood, and libel refers to the fictitious nature of the accusations. I hate this one because, okay, so obviously that is a terrible thing to say, full stop. Also, I hate this one because it does not make sense. Like in a baking sense, that does not track. <laughs> with, like I bake, I, this, yeah. this, I don't think this would work. So it makes me mad on two levels. In medieval times, though, you can see how people would believe it. What The other thing that gets me about this one is that this unscientific thing that now people would have the common sense to see is absolutely not true persisted into modern times where people have absolutely no excuse to not know better because you could just Google 100 bread recipes and see that none of them include blood. <laughs> You know what you should do? You should see if you can make bread with blood. I don't. Where would I get blood? I don't know. I mean, I have a Christian baby, but I, I'm kind of attached well, she's to her. A Catholic baby. She's not Christian. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you could, I'm kind of attached to her, though. Well, you could, uh, I don't know, you could uh, go to the Red Cross and then donate your blood and say, actually, can I have that back? <laughs> I need a couple of cups of it for reasons. Yeah, I brought my I got my haircut yesterday and I brought my old hair home with me. So <laughs> it would be on brand. Yeah, let Charlotte pull on that instead of your, uh, your <laughs> instead of my actual hair. That's, instead of your actual that's smart. So the thing is that like Christians would use this blood libel as a pretense to engage in violent pogroms uh, against their local Jewish community. A pogrom is when you basically get an angry mob to burn down a town, smash shop windows, kill people, rape people, the huge. And they would usually do that during or around the Jewish holiday of Pesach or Passover. Um, so if you needed another reason to not have a Christian Seder, that's a good one right there. If you needed another reason. If you needed another reason, Carissa Collins. So when you look at the blood libel though with the perspective of medieval medieval times it tracks like they did not have google it's horrible and tragic that a lot of people got killed over that but a lot of people got killed over stupid reasons in medieval, medieval times a lot of marginalized people got killed because of prejudice in medieval times it's it's not good but it's kind of just what happened what gets to me more is that it's still used as a reason to perpetrate violence like the poway synagogue shooter cited blood libel in his manifesto he named a Christian child from the 1500s who was supposedly killed in this manner. This is like the classical definition, the, the like blood in the matzah. That's the classical definition. And in, in like modern times, blood libel is used to refer to other libelous accusations against Jews. So basically, any untrue accusation against Jews, the purpose of which is to incite future violence or to justify 
previous acts of violence is also kind of today known as blood libel as well. It's pretty rare that you see like OG blood libel, like blood in the bread blood libel, but like you do see it from time to time. I hate all of it, but <laughs> I, I hope it's okay to say I hate the, o- the OG blood libel, as OG. you put it. Oh, I hate that the most because any reasonable person should be able to apply logic and figure out that that's not true with zero additional evidence. Well, like it's not like a meme at this point, but it is the sort of thing where if you see it, you screenshot it and send it to your friends. And you're like, holy shit, look at this. Like it is not completely eradicated in the year 2022 or the year 57. What is it? 5782. In the year 5782. 5782. Because it shows up in like 8chan manifestos. So just like we talked about at the end of the John Todd episode, the protocols takes all the things that the intended audience doesn't like, matches them together into one root problem, and blames that root problem on the group of people that the intended audience doesn't like. In this case, the uh, intended audience is Russians, and the people they don't like are Russian Jews, who the people who forged this document were actively trying to murder. The people who put the document together relied on every single stereotype and existing conspiracy theory about Jewish people to connect all of the problems that were going on in 1900s Russia, which was a lot of problems, into one thing so they could blame it on the people that they were trying to murder so they could murder them faster. So, of course, like John Todd's intended audience, of course, it w- namely is like evangelical Christians. They have a favorable view of Jews, Jewish people. So if he's going to repeat these things, he has to just like change the Jews to the Illuminati, uh, but still like make the same claims. So like if you're in the know, you'll understand that when he says the Illuminati, he means the Jews. Or when he says the Rothschild's banking family, he means the Jews. But the average fundy isn't going to know that. That's not going to set the alarm bells off for the average person. The other examples that you hear from this, like you see, you hear people say globalists or global elite or cosmopolitans. David Duke famously instructed his supporters to use the word Zionist in place of the word Jew in order to disguise the hatred, their anti-Semitism as being politically motivated rather than being racially motivated. Yeah, but... John Todd does name the Jews as part of the Illuminati, but he switches it up for his Christian audience because he makes a difference between these Jews that he's talking about that are part of the Illuminati and the Jews that his audience has a favorable view of. He categorizes them like that. You know what this reminds me of? What? I've mentioned on the show before that I heard so many conspiracy theories growing up about George Soros, how he has billions Mm. of dollars and he generates political unrest to benefit himself he wants to take over the world and like be in charge of everything he's personally responsible for a lot of the evil in the world i had no idea he was jewish i heard all of these stereotypes about him and as we get into this text you'll see that so many of them come directly from this document but it was just slightly removed from the because he's jewish part and it was removed just far enough that I was not aware that there was a connection. See, I, th- I think that's so funny that you had no idea. If I, or like, I think most Jewish people hear somebody bring up George Soros as like uh, the center of like their, you know, he- he's doing bad stuff, like it, immediate red flag, immediate alarm bells go off that this person is an anti-Semite. But you could have said that sort of thing and you didn't even know that he was Jewish. No, I had no yeah. idea. I thought he was a um, Mexican drug lord. Really? Yeah. I guess Soros sounds like it could be George Soros. Yeah. Wouldn't it be Jorge Soros? I, d- I guess it would be. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. No, the thing, so the, this thing is that the repackaging is that it essentially allows people to spew the worst kinds of blood libel and accuse Jews or, you know, specific groups of Jews of being pedophiles, drinking blood, harvesting the organs of children, engaging in blood rituals. Yes, this sacrifice. all sounds very familiar. Yeah. And then they'll turn around and say, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti and then insert whatever euphemism for jews is in is like the popular one of the day like i mean like the thing is that slurs like racial slurs against jews don't work the same as like they do for other groups of people like like say black people the n-word that comes from 
like slavery as far as i know yeah that i mean that that comes from like slavery and being like you know if you're saying that that's what you're saying to somebody is uh, is is that you're inferior to me but the way that it works for jews is that they're always just trying to say they want to say you so they invent a new word to mean jews and try to make it as innocuous and then make it as uh ubiquitous as possible you know just so that it get out, gets out there so that you know we can't control it and we can't like keep track of what they're saying about us so this is something that's really puzzled me because if you if you look at so I know that I know that QAnon is one conspiracy theory that you, it leans heavily on the protocols and uses a lot of anti-Semitic stereotypes in their th- conspiracy theories. But if you look at an average Q believer, they're talking blood libel, they're talking Illuminati, they're t- talking New World Order, and all of these are anti-Semitic dog whistles. Some of them are hundreds of years old. But that same average Q believer is probably an evangelical Christian who goes to church every Sunday. And they would tell you flat out that one of the reasons they voted for Trump is because he's pro-Israel. And even if they're uninformed or misinformed on the issue, they would identify strongly with Zionism. So if they go to church, they probably go to one of these churches that has satyrs. You know, they they, they go to <laughs> yeah. one of these churches that has like the American flag on one side and, and the Israel flag on the other side. <laughs> yeah. So how is somebody like that wrapped up in this huge anti-Semitic conspiracy theory? How are they talking out of both sides of their mouth like that? And do they not realize the cognitive dissonance? And now that we've been, we did the John Todd episode, and now that we've been researching this episode, I think I'm starting to see how these things overlap and how someone could be caught up in these theories that have deep roots in anti-Semitism, but not understand that the people that they hate politically are the same people that they like pseudo worship religiously. Yeah. But we're, we're going to get into that. I'm, I'm going to come back to that at the end of the episode and kind of wrap that up for you. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting observation. I personally think that hating Jews is the truest def- uh, demonstration of horseshoe theory in the world. Uh, of course, horseshoe theory is not applicable to everything or even most things, but I think it's extremely applicable to this particular issue. So I want to know what your overall impressions are as somebody who was raised within fundamentalism? So the first thing that I noticed when I started reading through is that there are a couple of stereotypes that you would have to believe from the outset for you to read the protocols and say, yeah, that makes sense to me. So even before you picked up a book that contained this document to read it, you would already have to believe that Jews control the majority of the wealth in the world and that they seek world domination. I think it's clear that the intended reader of the protocols has that assumption. But my question is why though? Okay, yes, why is that the assumption? But also why is there an assumption that any particular group of people seeks world domination? Is it because the intended reader is a person who seeks world domination? Like, Why is it that any conspiracy theory, like even even the occasional one that isn't um, directly about the Jews, always about someone who's trying to control the world? Like, Why is the conspiracy always so-and-so is trying to take over the world? A few things for me, at least with this. So this document was written like 120 years ago in Zara Russia uh, in like 1902, 1903 is when it was written. If you are a chauvinist people and you believe in your people's superiority and your leader's wisdom and your nation's unrivaled strength, why would you not believe that every other country also feels the same about their people. So this was about 10 years before the First World War. During this time, there was a large buildup of military. There was a lot of nationalism. There was a lot of chauvinism. And I think a perfect example of this is from like a generation after this was published, Adolf Hitler, firm believer in the protocols, believed that Jews were planning a world takeover. So partially in response to this belief and partially because he was like a violent psychopath who believed in eugenics and an extreme form of nationalism, he decided that he should be the one doing the world takeover, I guess. 
there's this fear of the other guys are going to take over the world and it leads to I better take over the world before they do. And I'm very familiar with that fear and that pattern of behavior because it's the same thing as Jack Scott standing up at youth conference talking about how Muslims have too many babies and they're going to take over the world if we don't have a lot of babies and witness to all their babies and turn them into Christians. I think that's a great example of how this sort of conspiracy theory would be appealing to Christian fundamentalists who are already thinking this way. There seem a lot of people have that fear of the people I don't like are trying to take over the world. I just I don't know that I have that same fear on the level that I see it portrayed in fundamentalism. I I, I don't think that I do because I I feel that anti LGBT and anti women's rights people are trying to take over the world, and as an LGBT person with a uterus, that does scare me. I do fear the quote unquote, the other guys taking over the world. But I don't what I don't feel is the need to conquer in response to that. Like I don't feel that I need to overtake them. And I don't feel that I need to eradicate their beliefs personally. I don't think it's my personal responsibility to wipe out the beliefs that I don't like wherever I see them. I more feel that it's my responsibility to work for regaining and maintaining equality. The great thing thing that you just said. We do have an episode planned for next month for Pride Month where we talk about like the mahusive projection that goes on with regards to the religious right and making accusations of certain things, libelous accusations against the LGBT community. Yeah, that's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be uh, some fun. So history lesson, during the late 19th, early 20th century in Russia, Jews were not particularly treated well. Um, so for the past 100 years or so, there have been laws in place saying that the Jews were segregated to living within what was called the Pale of Settlement. So sort of like Western reaches of the Russian Empire, which included like Moldova, Ukraine, Belarusia, Lithuania, and Poland. So mistreatment of Jews intensified when Tsar Alexander II was assassinated in 1881 by a populist group, and naturally everybody blamed the Jews. And so the Jewish communities were at this time largely impoverished shtetls. Um, they're subject to pogroms. So if you've seen Fiddler on the Roof, you know, uh, after they have Seidel and Model's wedding and the Russians come and burn their town, that's what would happen. Basically led to 40 years of mass immigration of Jews to Poland, to Germany, France, North America, and what is today Israel, but what at the time was a colony held by the Ottoman Empire known as Ottoman Palestine. So some of the Jews decided to stay in Russia. Some of them did so because they were businessmen or intellectuals. And if you were like an intellectual, you'd be more likely to be involved with Marxism and the Bolsheviks. So in 1903, when the protocols was published, if you were a supporter of the monarchy and you wanted to fight what was unstoppable rising tide of Marxism, an easy and effective strategy to do so would be to try to smear Marxism as part of a Jew Jewish plot for world domination because everybody already hates the Jews, thinks that they're like trying to sow instability within the monarchy because, you know, they assassinated the, the czar a couple decades ago and they associate them with Marxism anyway. So is not so much the Jews are evil because they're Marxist bent on world domina domination, but it's the Marxists are evil because they're Jews bent on world domination. And it wouldn't have been necessary to write a document that people would use as a pre tends to murder Jews in Russia because in the 1900s, people were already doing that and they didn't really need an excuse. But what kind of flipped this on its head and kind of turned this into the thing that it became now is when the Marxists actually seized power in Russia. And so it went from don't let the Marxists take over because they're part of a Jewish plot for world domination to let's get rid of the Jews or they will overthrow us and install a Marxist state like they did in Russia. Sorry, I was just processing. <laughs> yeah, you see how that, because we found a, a translation of this because it was within a publication, like a different publication. And that was the argument. It was like, see, look what happened in Russia. We got to get rid of these guys. They're bad. But it was, you know, from like 1920. Look what they did a few years ago in Russia. Look mm -hmm. at, the, at the... Yeah. So I, that makes a little more sense why the assumption is always that someone is trying to take over the world. 
The other assumption I think that people would have to have before even picking up this book, if it was going to make any sense to them, is that Jewish people believe themselves to be smarter and more cunning than others. And I kind of have to assume that it's the same question, same answer in a broad sense. During the Middle Ages... Uh, and the Renaissance, Jews were forbidden from owning land, which meant that they were forced into professions that often required an education. So like medicine, trade, and also for other reasons, banking. So do you know why Jews were forbidden from owning land to begin with? I mean, obviously, because someone hated them. But was there a specific reason for land ownership being the prohibition? Was it that if you had land, you could vote? Or if you had land, you could be in government? Something like that? I mean, it, it okay. might have just been because they weren't Christian. I don't know. Uh, I, you're I, right. It's the Middle Ages. People didn't really need a practical reason to do a terrible thing. And not being Christian was a big deal. Also, like in the Middle Ages, up through the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, if you knew how to read, that's the basic level. Like if you knew how to read, you were considered educated. And literacy rates for Jews were generally higher due to the professions that they were allowed to take part in. I definitely want you to, to correct me if I'm wrong, but it almost feels like the intended audience are supposed to be offended that someone dare think themselves richer or smarter than they are. That's kind of the thing. Do you remember a few years ago when like arguing with alt-right people on the internet who would talk about like IQ tests of different like races, like the average IQ for like different races? And this, this is a big thing a few years ago years ago on Reddit before Reddit banned like all the alt-right subs. I do not remember this, but it seems extremely pro problematic. <laughs> Yeah, because IQ tests measure one very specific type of intelligence and mainly mainly reading comprehension and your ability to take tests. I mean, IQ tests, it's not actually like a, a good way to measure somebody's intelligence. It's not going to tell you how smart a person is. And there's like a cultural weight to it as well someone's outcome on an IQ test is going to be highly influenced by not only what type of test it is and whether that matches their natural inclinations and capabilities, but also by all of these cultural factors, like what kind of funding their school got and the nutrition they had growing up and whether they got enough sleep at night growing up and their stress levels and a lot of other things where there are very real racial and cultural and class disparities even now. Like, But these alt-right people, um, when they were talking about this, they, they would always cite numbers. So they'd say Ashkenazi Jews have the highest IQ, then it's Asian Americans, then it's white people, and then... After white people, it's all the races that the that they consider to be inferior. So, you know, like Hispanic, black people, like ev everyone else is, is below them. And then they point to this and say, see, whites are the superior race uh, because the Jews are sneaky smart and you can't trust them. And the Asians are smart. But then they, you know, rifle off a bunch of other racist stereotypes about Asians that I don't really want to say on this podcast uh, to just make it be like, oh, but they're not a threat. They're not, you know, dangerous to us. And then it's white people. So and everybody below white people is stupid. So it's like the, the exact same thing where they're like saying, OK, the Jews are smart, but you use your power to outsmart and subjugate other people so you can't be trusted. Therefore, being smart is bad. I still think that people who believe in this are kind of telling on themselves, though, because they're they're ranking people by one measure of intelligence, which is faulty. But the presumption is that people at the top of the ranking system are always going to have only their own interests at heart and they're going to be ruthless in pursuing their own interests. It's like assuming that all strong men are rapists, so The Rock must just assault every woman he has a chance to. It's assuming that anyone with power will always assert that power over other people, which is a very scary way to look at the world. Well, the number one thing to know about conspiracy theories is that they exist to make Johnny Smoothbrain feel like a genius. You know, like he's like, oh, everyone else, you're whole life has told you that you're stupid, but you're the only one who's read the signs correctly. And everyone who is more successful, who's better educated, who's better connected, they're the ones who let this slip by them. They're the ones who didn't see it. Like they exist not just to make you feel like you're right, but also to like validate your entire identity as somebody who has been right the whole time about everything. 
in the world and every opinion that you've ever had is right because it you know it goes in with this conspiracy so it makes sense that they'll tell you well you're actually the smartest because all the people who are like smarter than you are actually weak or evil yeah, I I still do think that it it's very much telling on yourself though to say that well if I was the smartest person in the world I would use my smarts to take over the world. Yeah. So so what we did is we both read through this document. We each pulled out things that we thought were worth talking about. So I was wondering um yeah, let's go ahead and start on on those uh things that we pulled out that were worth talking about. We noticed that the protocols themselves there are 24 points in the protocols. The are the ways and the specific plans on how the Jews are going to execute their plan to take over the world. They loosely fall into four categories. So one is financial control and economic policy. Two is political control and world government. Three is control of speech and the press. And then four is installing a one world ruler in the person of the king of Israel as ruler over the entire world. So let's start with financial and economic control. Do you want to start with a couple of the quotes that you pulled? This is from, uh, I think, Protocol 6. Uh, So it says, Let us raise wages, which, however, will be of no benefit to the workers, for we will simultaneously cause the rise in prices of objects of first necessity under the pretext that this is due to the decadence of agriculture and of the cattle industry. We will also artificially and deeply undermine the sources of production by teaching Teaching the workmen anarchy and use of alcohol. The idea of artificially raising wages, thus increasing the cost of the necessaries of life, is something that is very prevalent in modern thinking. Like we were talking about earlier, I have I don't see this, I don't think I've ever seen this attributed to the Jews by name, but I absolutely have seen this attributed to mm-hmm. the global elite. Like I've seen this on Facebook recently. This isn't even something that's contained to QAnon or to the broader world of right-wing conspiracy theorists. This is something that I've seen from like church lady Facebook multiple times. The type of this is like Reaganomics. What the supposed writers of the protocols are intending to do is the opposite of Reaganomics, right? Yeah. It's demand side. Yeah, so it's like the the conservatives who are against wage increases will are saying that it's going to increase cost and then there's also like a very detailed section about how the cabal will institute a progressive tax rates as part of their plan for their world takeover wait didn't you tell me about this didn't you tell me about why reaganomics is anti-semitic and people don't know it maybe possibly i can't remember this just sparked a memory from like way way back i think it was one of our super early episodes maybe even before we had patreon was it reaganomics i don't know if it was reaganomics i can't remember that i feel like we've t- i feel like we've talked about this concept but this is exactly what i see on social media if you can remember what that was like if you can remember when i told sadie that reaganomics was anti-semitic uh please send it to me because i can't remember if i did or not um <laughs> <laughs> but I but I see this uh, this idea of like oh the elite are raising in their their it's the elite behind people wanting a living wage because they're just going to raise the the cost of products to match that it's not going to do you any good. Logic leads me to think that this economic theory existed and then was picked up by the protocols, not that the protocols invented it, but I have to wonder if this is the document that brought it to mainstream attention. So I've seen a lot of arguments for like Reaganomics in the past, but none of them have said that Reaganomics, uh, that like supply side economics is a necessity in order to counter the international Jewish conspiracy. <laughs> it just, it, it just makes you think though, because it's not logical to jump to the conclusion that everybody who is against raising the minimum wage uh, is a secret anti-Semite or that Ronald Reagan was and he read the protocols and he based his economic policy on on them. No, that would be Richard Nixon. Heyo. <laughs> <laughs> but it isn't so much of a leap to think that he was influenced by the conspiracy theories around this document or that people who believe that were in part influenced by the theories in this document. It's absolutely plausible that someone who did read this and believe it and make decisions based on it and therefore had a very negative view of raising minimum wage later influenced somebody who influenced Reagan and other conservative politicians and decision makers who influenced church people who are posting on Facebook. 
Facebook about why it's wrong to raise the minimum wage. What do we know about Reagan's rise to power in 1980? It was due in large part to have to him making common cause with the evangelical mu- uh, movement who were socially conservative, but they viewed Nixon as far too dirty and corrupt to get behind. We also know from our research about John Todd that the evangelical movement at this time was already teeming with this sort of conspiracy. The other thing is that if you look at when the protocols came from, it was partially an argument against Marxism. What does Marxism say as like, I guess, part of its basic tenets is that the workers needed to be treated better. Um, That was like Mm -hmm. one of the main arguments behind it. And they're like, well, we can't treat the workers better because it won't actually be good for them. You see? It it is. Yeah, it all makes sense when you look into it for like three seconds. Because not, I, I think how this gets to evangelical Christianity is that not everyone bought John Todd's elaborate theory about the Illuminati, which was pretty much pulled directly from the protocols. But a huge number of evangelical Christians bought into the satanic panic which was very influenced by john todd so i think that's the line of like how an idea gets from a 1902 russian political propaganda forgery onto my facebook feed so i want to move on to a different quote uh specifically regarding economics can i read this one let's do it the people are shackled by poverty to heavy labor more surely than they were by slavery and serfdom. They could liberate themselves from those in one way or another, whereas they cannot free themselves from misery. We have included in constitutions rights, which for the people are fictitious and are not actual rights. All the so-called rights of the people can exist only in the abstract and never be realized in practice. So that last quote, that one to me, that's a real doozy. Where have you seen those sentiments before? Because I've seen it in multiple places. I want to know what jumps to mind for you. So Sovereign Citizen was the first bell that that rang for me. Really? Yeah. When we were researching Kent Hovind's tax drama, my husband and I watched a documentary on Sovereign Citizens and the quote, uh, rights which for the people are fictitious and not actual rights could have come right out of a subset manifesto see that's really interesting because you're like totally 100 percent right about that but i like two places popped up for me and neither of those were the places that that i was thinking that oh interesting neither of those are, are sovereign yeah okay so what else came up for you reading that quote number one maybe this is a bit more minor do you ever see conservatives or like confederate apologists making like well slavery wasn't actually that bad kind of arguments you know yeah somebody did this on twitter like three weeks ago and absolutely got dragged to hell and back over it oh god so that was the guy that said if i were around 150 years ago i'd probably own slaves but i'd treat them right george washington and thomas jefferson owned slaves and they weren't racist that guy yes that's that's the guy (laughs) he was he was framing it as like oh well later generation slaveholders didn't have as much moral culpability for that sin and that crime because it wasn't their fault because they were raised to see slavery as Mm. normal and it was just their way of life. I don't know. Maybe he sees people who fail to deconstruct the harmful social norms that they were raised with as blameless, like, I don't know, the norm of patriarchy in the church or something like that. Uh, I don't like... I th- sometimes people forget that what you say on the internet lasts forever and I would have owned slaves but I wouldn't have been racist isn't exactly a hill that I would recommend dying on that's, a, that's not a hill I would recommend climbing or no, looking at abs- <laughs> like you can look at it from afar and you can say I don't want to go on that hill that hill looks racist <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah, he doubled down on like he like people called him out on it and he doubled down on it too. Oh, I don't know what goes through a guy's mind when he when he decides that. Oh man. There's another place where um I've seen this sentiment as well, and I think this place is maybe a little bit more interesting. Okay. Um so do you ever see people who are uh, hard and outspoken critics of capitalism and they compare being working class in America to being free by technicality, but not by in any 
true sense of the word. Okay, yes. So I would definitely identify as a critic of capitalism, but I but I do I do see that t- comparison being made. I think a loose comparison is not out of line, but an equivalence is not accurate and I do see a lot of people making that a direct equivalence. Yeah. Like the so the argument that they make is that while you are not legally the property of the employer as you would be if you you know were an actual enslaved person, uh, you are essentially trapped in a situation that is impossible for you to get out of. You know, because because with slavery you were held in physical bonds, but under capitalism your bonds are financial and societal, and therefore much more difficult to escape from. So I see the equivalence is in things like speeding tickets and other examples of the tax on being poor. Like speeding is against the law for people who can't afford a ticket, but is it against the law in the same way for someone who can't just pay a ticket without thinking about it if they get one? Yeah. Like it's really only against the law for people people who are wealthy to speed if they get multiple tickets and points on their license. And even then they can pay lawyers to potentially lessen the effects of that or the likelihood of a negative outcome. It's completely accurate. And fair to say under our current laws and and the the way our economy is run right now, there are tens of millions of people in this country who are deeply exploited. Oh, yeah. That's not an unfair thing to say at all. Yeah. Or that freedom is relative in a tiered justice system. And and there are tons of other examples of the poor tax that I could cite. That's just the one that came to mind. But it's not an equivalence to somebody saying that they own you. It's I don't like making a a this equals slavery because the only thing that equals slavery is slavery. Right. It's like the same reasons I don't equate anything to the Holocaust ever. What we're trying to figure out here is where where do we draw the line, right? Between when it's getting into when we're like, okay, yes, I'm I'm fairly criticizing the current economics or I'm I'm criticizing the way that the economy in our country is run. And where do we go from there? to this is uh invoking the protocols of the elders of zion because where i see it getting into that problematic territory territory is when people allege a grand and overarching conspiracy that is intentionally keeping them poor or when people allege that their current situation is due to a plan from a, like a, a global cabal made up of the corporate elite uh you know the billionaires the millionaires in order to create a workforce that is so dependent on them combined with a poor economy that it makes them endlessly exploitable without recourse and without the option to leave that's where i see that the line is i agree with that I do think that the viewpoint of there is a global cabal of corporate elite who are keeping me down is a tempting viewpoint, especially when we live in times that are so <clears throat> unprecedented as the times that we are living in now. Uh, I think that it is really, really tempting when we've lived through a pandemic. I mean, people our age came of age financially into a recession and now are coming into the time that we would be wanting to have children in a massive recession and high inflation. I think that it can feel very personal. And the idea that there is a cabal of global elite making this happen to me is so tempting. But I think we also have to Mm -hmm. consider the Occam's razor Like the simplest answer is usually the right answer. And it is simpler to think that corporate elites are just doing what's best for them and makes them the most money. And that the disadvantages that the workforce faces is a side effect of their desire to do what's best for them. That it's not because the the people who run large companies are hatching some massive conspiracy. When I dug into why am I feeling like the corporate elites are having it out for me and uh, doing a conspiracy to keep me down, when I dug into those feelings, I realized that I really don't think that Jeff Bezos opposes unions at Amazon because he's evil and wants to take over the world as part of some grand plan that he's hatched with his friends Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. I think he opposes unions because they aren't in his personal best interest and you don't get to where he's gotten to in life without looking out for number one 
even at the detriment of others. See, I think that's dead on. I also think it's it's a lot easier for people to cope with their bad current situation if they believe that all the power in the world is hell bent on keeping them down rather Mm -hmm. than like the reality, which is that their employers are almost single-mindedly focused on profit and they view the little people at the bottom as like disposable. It's a form of fantasy thinking because the, Mm. the reality is that people are just generally selfish It's the old Lucille Bluth, like how much could a banana possibly cost? (laughs) It's not that that Lucille was evil. It's not that she specifically wanted to hurt and exploit other people. It's that she lived life from her perspective and that led to behaviors that had evil consequences. I think also like it's easier to cope with hatred than it is to cope with contempt and indifference. Like if somebody hates you, they at least have to think about you enough to hate you. If like they know who you are, they know your name and they know you exist. They know everything about you and they have to put effort into destroying you. If somebody has indifference for you, that is so much more dehumanizing because to them, you might not even exist. Yeah, It's also like a little bit of like main character syndrome. Like it's easier to suffer if you feel like your suffering is part of like a, a big climactic struggle between good and evil and exploiting this like that, like exploiting that idea is a radicalization technique that is used prolifically in online recruiting from everybody from like, you know, QAnon to like far right militia type groups, you know, like your, your proud boys, uh, those type groups to also like religious fundamentalist groups like ISIS. That's one of the reasons why they would they would really target disaffected young men and tell them that like your life is terrible because of these people join our struggle against uh Mm -hmm. against like that yeah well i can tell you for sure that that idea that your suffering is part of a grand plan and people are out to make you suffer but you can fight back that is absolutely used in cults as well and specifically in the ifb i think in the ifb we tended to blame either well satan at the top of it and then satan's minions either the liberal mob or the muslims or whoever it was that we were hating that particular week the gays the gay the the gay agenda all but that's blue haired feminists the blue haired feminist (laughs) moms but all all of that all of those groups were the villain at one point or another but that idea of like your your suffering is part of a larger struggle was used a lot in the IFB. So to some, we got a, a little off track there, but to sum up the financial plan, the the plan laid out by the protocols is to support workers' rights publicly, but use that issue and other issues to create financial upheaval, causing the world to become more dependent on Jewish money. And then as the financial state of the world gets worse and worse, the face organizations of this conspiracy will continue to position themselves as fighting for the rights of the people and gain trust from the populace, which will allow them to install a one world world government, which leads us to talking about what the protocols have to say about politics and a one world government. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that right after the break. All right, let's go take up the offering. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, That group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. All right, we are back from our break. We are talking about the one, the only, the mother of all conspiracy theories, the Protocols of the Elders of (laughs) Zion. Uh, Sadie, do you want to read this next quote, or do you want me to? Um, I can let you read it. We talked about uh, quotes that relate to financial control and we're moving on to politics, one world government. So yeah. if you, you you can go ahead and read the next one. The next one's from Pro- Protocol 10. Th- this is in reference to methods by which the government will be taken over. So this quote is, to attain this, we must force all to vote without class 
class discrimination to establish the autocracy of the majority, which cannot be obtained from the intellectual classes alone. Through this method of accustoming everyone to the idea of self-determination, we will shatter the Goy family and its educational importance. We will not allow the formation of individual minds because the mob, under our guidance, will prevent them from distinguishing themselves or even expressing themselves. The mob has become accustomed to listen only to us who pay it for obedience and attention. We will thus create such a blind power that it will be unable to move without the guidance of our agents sent by us to replace their leaders. Wow, that's a doozy right there. What did you think about that? Well, what we did to create this episode is we both pulled quotes that seemed extra relevant from our perspective, things we wanted to talk about. And this was the first time we pulled the exact same quote. I remember I pasted into the document and you pasted into the document like at the same time. And you're like, no way. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, it, it's got several ele- elements that show up in modern conspiracy theories like this quote alone. We could do a whole episode <laughs> just on this quote. I feel like. I know. I know because it's got like it's got these elements that show up in in conspiracy theories, but it's also got these elements that show up in mainstream right wing thought like people like um, Tucker Carlson, blah, who dabbles on the fringe of conspiracy theories and throws out a lot of buzzwords, but doesn't so often come right out and say conspiracy theory stuff. Like he'll allude to it all the time, <clears throat> but he won't yeah. straight up say it. At least, the, at least the the most recent clips I saw of him, I've been avoiding his clips. So that's that was my perception of him when I did try to follow what kind of bull he was saying. So I see um, in that quote, shattering the family, which is something we see in in relation to same-sex marriage. But I'm also starting to see this pop up from a lot of homeschooling influencers, uh, along with the idea of schools not allowing individual thinking or individual thinking not being allowed. That one is gaining a lot of ground uh, with homeschooling people. But of course, I was also just floored by the idea here of forcing, quote unquote, forcing everyone to vote. I would love to know if there's a connection between that appearing in the protocols and modern voting rights struggles. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because like, I mean, on on the surface, at least Christian fundamentalists, the fundies in the US, they're very patriotic. They like they often they'll use the language about liberty, freedom, uh, democracy. It's weird to see how that sort of thing can also be squared with the suppression of voting rights in particular uh, with regards to blocks of voters who oppose them ideologically. To answer that question, I want to call back to our abortion episode. We talked in the abortion episode about how it's my opinion that many, if not most, evangelical Christians who oppose abortion really sincerely believe that fetuses are human beings with rights under the Constitution. They've been told straight up lies and twisted truths to support that idea and further foster that idea. So they think that there is actually proof for that. And that's where I disagree. But I but that I I I really believe that that many people who are against abortion for religious reasons have a sincere religious belief. I think their belief is incorrect, but I don't doubt their sincerity. And in the same way, I really think that Christian fundamentalists specifically who support more stringent voting laws, laws that look from my perspective like voter suppression, truly believe that a lot of people vote illegally or fraudulently. I remember growing up hearing that voter corruption was so bad in Chicago that every single election, thousands and thousands of people who were dead had votes cast in their name. And I heard that just as an undisputed fact. On a side note, I do think this is one factor that made evangelicals so ready to accept the idea that the 2020 election was corrupt because they had been primed for that idea for literal decades. But the, the answer to your question of how does patriotism square with the suppression of voting rights, I think that people believe that huge percentages of the votes cast in the U.S. are fraudulent. They think that undocumented people vote multiple times. They think that votes are bought by George Soros. All of these myths that are now mainstream due to QAnon and right-wing conspiracies were just facts of life in my childhood. 
So did you ever, um, either when you were in the IFB or since having left the IFB, did you hear people complaining about elections being swung one way or the other thanks to uh quote unquote, low information voters. I've definitely heard that phrase. I feel like when I was in the IFB, though, it wasn't the prevalent train of thought. I did hear, uh, yeah, don't vote without knowing who you're voting for, do your research. But that was more of a code phrase for make sure the person you're voting for is a real conservative and not secretly supportive of gay people. What I picked up wasn't people who vote Democrat don't have enough information. It was more people who vote Democrat are evil or support evil things or are dependent on wealth fair and want to game the system. So it's a different kind of racism than what you're describing. Yeah, because I've definitely seen supporters of some political candidates express the sentiment that uh, the, the sort of sentiment of uh, supporters of my candidates, of, of my favorite candidate's opponent, don't know who they're voting for. And if we could only, I guess for lack of a better word, evangelize to them, they'd clearly see that my candidate is the superior candidate, is better in every way. And I, I've, I've seen those uh, those sentiments in state, local, national races. And it's sort of like what we were talking about with economic control. So this attitude isn't great it's kind of problematic but it doesn't really start to get into like protocols territory until they start invoking a grand conspiracy to keep their preferred candidate out of power yes and i think that if someone read the protocols and then wrote voting policy out of fear of them coming true it would be a lot more extreme than what we're seeing currently so i don't want to instill panic that someone is trying to run the republican party off of the protocols trying to prevent them from coming true i do have to wonder though if this the basic fear that's described here the idea not everyone is qualified to vote and allowing or compelling everyone to vote is an evil thing does that basic fear come from the protocols is that something that has been passed down through generations mm. and then resulted in voter suppression legislation in 2021 2022 there are a lot of things from this document i don't necessarily think that certain political party or certain political leaders are literally reading the protocols and then go making going and making decisions off of them but i think that the fear that was instilled by the protocols or the fear that was incited by the protocols is the kind of fear that can be passed down through generations yeah i, th I think that's an astute observation this whole thing feels to me like somebody took the protocols and then started playing telephone with them so you start off with the jews are planning to control the world and you end with the jews control the world per Purple monkey dishwasher. Well, that's my entire point about how they may have influenced fundamentalism and the IFB and the evangelical right in general. I'm not at all saying, oh, Jack Hiles read the protocols and believed them. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I do see is, well, someone read them and may or may not have fully believed them, but they got some fears from the protocols, like catching a cold. They caught some basic fears and then they passed on their cold. They passed on those fears to someone else. And then someone down the line passed them to Jack Hiles and then he passed them on to other influential IFB preachers. And then those fears that were passed on like a virus became part of the of what makes the IFB the IFB. Do you want to read the next section or should I? Because this section feels like it's like directly out of the John Todd speech. So you do the next one. And then I have two little snippets that I want to talk about on the topic of political control, one world government, all that stuff. Great. OK, so this one is what form of government can be given to societies in which bribery has penetrated everywhere, where riches are obtained only by clever tricks and semi fraudulent means, where corruption reigns, where morality is sustained by punitive measures and strict laws and not by voluntary acceptance of moral principles where cosmopolitan convictions have eliminated. We will create a strong centralized government so as to gather the social forces into our power. We will mechanically regulate all the functions of political life of our subjects by new laws. These laws will gradually eliminate all the concessions and liberties permitted by the Goys. Our kingdom will be crowned by such a majestic despotism that it will be able at all times and in all places to crush both antagonistic and discontented goys. Hmm. 
that section, I think that's the crux of it right here. This section is probably the section that I've, this is like the John 316 of the protocols of the elders <laughs> of Zion. You know, this is the section that I've seen also invoked most frequently by people who didn't even know, like know what they were saying, who didn't know where it came from, who didn't know what they were talking about, um, and who didn't know like literally the source of their own political beliefs and and ideologies. So you're talking about the idea that um, so which which part of this are you picking out? Riches are obtained only by clever tricks and semi fraudulent means. Yes. So I I struggle I struggle with this one a little bit because. Uh, hold on. I'm trying to get my thoughts. I'm, try- I'm trying to get my thoughts correct here. Uh, I'm genuinely asking, do you think it's anti-Semitic to recognize a society where it's easier to get rich by tricks or frauds or corruption? No. I mean, that's, that's okay. just uh, that's just how it is for a lot of the world. OK, because OK, that's where I misunderstood you because I was I was going to say, yeah, but that's kind of how it is. What what they're saying is that they make it this way on purpose. Oh. They basically make it. Okay, I'm glad I asked. They're making a society intentionally that is corrupt, and so therefore, all of the people who participate within that society are forced to also engage in corruption, and therefore, their morality uh, will also be corrupted mm-hmm. by it. And, and the answer to that is the same thing that I was saying earlier. Is that it's not the the most logical thing is not to look at a society that is full of corruption and scams and tricks and this, that and the other and go, oh, people are making it this way on purpose to get the good people down. The more logical thing to think is, oh, this society is corrupt because humans do corrupt things and that's how human nature is. Yeah. So, but hmm. you're saying that the idea that that society is made that way on purpose is anti-Semitic. I can get with that. Yeah. That um. That basically the that the Jews are a corrupting, corrupting influence mm-hmm. on society. Yeah. But it, I was wondering, it, it, did you hear anything like that? I mean, I know that you guys had your doctrine of separation from society that mm-hmm. you thought that society itself was corrupt. No, I don't. This is one thing I don't remember seeing or hearing growing up in the IFB because I think the what the IFB would say about that is society is corrupt because of sin. It, like it's the sin nature that's in all people. So it's not the devil. It, yeah, it's Satan, but it's not it's not human people that are making society systematically corrupt. It's that all humans are corrupt and therefore make a corrupt society. Not that some not that some group or person other than Satan is leading the whole thing. So it wouldn't be that the Satanists are intentionally corrupt. Like I guess it, Within the satanic panic, because, I mean, we, we heard from John Todd similar things that basically all of this stuff is corrupt and that you can't basically be a member of government without being corrupt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't hear that at all growing up in the IFB, because you have to remember um, Jim Bob Duggar ran for state senate. Hmm. If you couldn't be in government without being corrupt, how could he have been a senator, state senator? See, OK, so this is really surprising to me. And this is like in like a good way, though. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, I love like, when I, that happens every once in a while. Because I, w- you know, I would have expected. Because I mean, you know, I, I know, like, I, I totally understand if somebody says, "I think that our government is corrupt, and I don't want," and you know, I personally wouldn't want to be a part of the government because I just wouldn't want to be around that. And no, being in government is seen as like, like, yeah, you're gonna have to rub shoulders with a lot of people who are corrupt because a lot of people in government are. But it's a calling, and you go into that world of sin and corruption and to bring light yeah because i mean the same 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 with mike pence speaking at first baptist church of hammond right because he he is he is kind of is he full fundy or is he i would like to do an episode if if he tries to run for political office on a national scale again i would like to do an episode on his beliefs i'm sure i can dig up like what what churches he's attended and and piece together some of his beliefs from things that he said you watched freaks and geeks right i had yeah. you watch freaks and geeks he reminded me of the of nick andopoulos's dad who sold his drum set oh yeah yeah i <laughs> i don't know what his religious beliefs are so i don't know if i could say oh he's fundamentalist or not um because I don't know, I know he won't be in a room alone with a woman. Yeah, and that's a how. very that's a very funny thing. Because they'll they'll support. This is interesting because I've also sort of seen this as like 
a well trump is is we know trump is corrupt but he's in the government so everyone in the government is corrupt like i've definitely seen that i've seen sentiment. that i've seen everybody hates him because he's the one guy in the government who isn't corrupt i've also seen well yeah he has to do some corrupt things because everyone in the government is corrupt but he's he doesn't like doing the corrupt things and he's eventually going to bring about the end of this whole corrupt system where people don't have to do that anymore which didn't happen uh, sadly <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh man that's that's interesting do you want to do you want to read your snippets yeah let's go to my my two things i don't want to spend too much time talking about them because they're not strongly related to either john todd or QAnon, but they are strongly related to the ifb so i want to make sure i get to them before we leave this section yeah t- tell me about this the first one's from protocol one and it's something that jumped out one of the first things that jumped out to me as i was reading through the quote is The people of the Goys are stupefied by spiritist liquors. Their youth is driven insane through excessive study of the classics and vice to which they have been instigated by our agents, tutors, valets, governesses, in rich houses, by clerks, and so forth, and by our women in the pleasure palaces of the Goys. So there's a lot there. (laughs) There, Yeah. There is so much in that. It's like two sentences and holy cow, there is a lot in there. Yeah. Uh, Some of it I'm not going to quite get to, but I found the phrase, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm not going to get into how to, how Jewish women were put in a position where sex work was the most viable option for them because of the, mm, because of racism, survival sex work. Mm, not going to do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. We are not a swerfy podcast. It's like one here. of my, it's one of my little, it's one of my pet soap boxes. If you're given the opportunity to talk about, like if she is given the opportunity to talk about that, she will talk about it. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm just I'm trying so hard not to derail this episode. Well, also, though, there is also the stereotype of like the the the, the Jewish woman as the like, like the as, femme as, fatale. Like, yeah, the femme fatale is the temptress uh, for. Yeah, which the, is the man, because yeah. many Jewish women were put in a position where sex work was the only viable option to feed their family because of racism. Yep. And good times. The and Not when times, you yeah. are put in a position where you become a survival sex worker, um, the society that puts you in that position usually turns directly around and shames you for being a sex worker. It's not great. Yeah. Which happens in 2022, which is <sighs> one of the primary reasons that trans women are like 18 times more likely to be murdered than any other category of people that's true and that's yeah. and the survival sex work is one of the big reasons why aside yeah. like alongside like regular transphobia well also there's the whole situation where a lot of them can just get like uh, there's a lot of places in this country where if your landlord finds out that you're a transgender then they can just fucking evict you uh, yeah. without any other other reason and so you'll end up homeless which is an extremely unsafe situation for any woman bad 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 stuff but you yep. know if you talk about that then you're like the fucking woke mob yeah who's trying to who's trying to destroy the goy family and its educational importance exactly ha. that yeah okay. so so what i actually wanted to get to in that quote before i could not resist a soapbox was the phrase excessive study of the classics i found that interesting mm. because i see the reflection of a lot of ifb homeschool culture and church school culture in that especially thinking about ace and their absolutely abysmal english and literature curriculum well they did try and protect your eyes from a literature that was deemed unsavory such as uh shakespeare yes well the fear that has been instilled is that quote excessive study of the classics will lead to insanity oh hey look bill gothard popping up here in this episode that was right and what did he have to say about insanity it's something odd i can't remember it was something about like a spirit being divided against oh, right, right, right. itself a spirit dividing it against itself so if you are indecisive you'll end up with dissociative identity disorder and insanity and then and then you'll kill yourself yes that that is what Bill Gothard said. Uh, Fuck that guy. Um, what a nutbag. So the the idea, though, here, like the, the basic fear that's been instilled is that getting the youth caught up in studying classics is a distraction from the great global cabal's evil plan. And the result is that fundamentalists 
don't care much about teaching the classics. Well, this maybe this is also why in 2022, all the movies that are coming out are either remakes or sequels, uh, because the cabal is only interested in keeping us interested in the classics and nothing new. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I feel like after researching this episode, we could write conspiracy theories. Like if, if we yeah. if we don't want to do the podcast anymore, we can just get a job writing for like you know conspiracy theory Inc. and make a bunch of money. You get paid by the face. You get paid by the Facebook share. <laughs> From what like we figured out last week with John Todd, even making up f-ing conspiracy theories as a joke is a bad idea, and you shouldn't do it. Oh because- right, the Illuminati guys that contributed yeah. to like the destruction of the world yeah it's don't do that don't make up conspiracy theories even as a joke because or and like publish them places because people will like latch onto it and think it's real um, darn it i was planning my future career okay yeah. uh the other the other little piece that i wanted to address uh was from protocol number three uh the quote is the goys are no longer accustomed to think without our scientific advice. Fear and mistrust of doctors has been a growing thing in Christian fundamentalism for decades. And it's it's not new because of COVID. It's just been put into overdrive. The mistrust of vaccines, mistrust of doctors in general, this is not something that's just recently come up where fundamentalists are concerned. So like pandemic. Sure, but that's like the mainstream expression of this fear. The mistrust of the medical system has been like a thing for fundies for a very long time. I remember when I was a kid, my parents took us to doctors if if something serious happened, but they didn't take us for stuff that they thought was minor because they had the idea that doctors were just unnecessary for minor things. And then they had a very high threshold for what they would consider minor. If we were in real danger, of course they took us to the doctor, but they did not take us for stuff that I absolutely would take Chuck to the doctor for. Like what? Uh, like like a cold, like a, like a bad cough or cold, or like a high fever. I guess my dad was a doctor, so it's like he's going to come home from afterwards. So you, I, yeah, I guess you didn't I, go to the doctor because your dad would look at you and go, yeah, you need to go to the doctor or no. No, he, like, he would just be like, a, take some chewable Advil and go to sleep early or something that was it like see like uh, like a uh, i think a lot of parents worry about high fevers especially with like really young kids right because that could be infection or like that meningitis could be... or something i would take chuck straight to the doctor but my parents were would were more like okay well let me run you a bath and put some ice in it it wasn't that they were neglectful it's just that they had a very high threshold for what they thought was doctor worthy for a lot of reasons one of those reasons is that we didn't have good health insurance but another reason was that they just they had this perception that doctors want you to come to them for everything and become dependent on them and that a lot of things doctors are just not necessary for. There's also, of course, the fear that if they took us to the doctors, the doctor would ask if we were ever spanked or beaten at home and then the CPS people would take us away. So an example would be I sliced my knee open to the bone and when I was a kid and I still have a massive scar from it. My dad t- just <laughs> my dad duct taped my leg to a ruler so I couldn't bend it while it was healing. <laughs> and that was the <laughs> that was the fix for my problem. <laughs> So that's the fun story of how I've seen my kneecap. I mean, it did it work? Yeah. I mean, the scar well, is... There you go. <laughs> the scar is horrible, but I was fine. Scars are cool. Like, it's not like a a disfiguring scar. It's not like you're trying to... Your, your income uh, uh, is dependent on you selling, like, kneecap picks. <laughs> uh, hey, you don't know my life. <laughs> But we knew, but back to like mistrusting the medical establishment in general, we knew a lot of parents who did not take their kids to doctors even when they really, really should have, even when duct tape and a ruler was not good enough to fix their kids' wounds. Um, and I, I wonder if this is one factor in the mistrust of the medical system. Yeah, I mean, that, that really might have something to do with it. I mean, because like, if you're a doctor, chances are you're not a fundy. Because like there's there's not going to be a big overlap between people who are like hardcore fundamentalists and people who go to medical school. Yeah, there is there, there are some, but it's pretty uncommon. How, how are you like? How are you going to know which doctor? Like who you could trust, especially like unless you went if, to First Baptist Church of Hammond where they had their own doctor. Right, and especially you know if you take your uh, kids into the the pediatrician into like a family practice and something and your kids say something wrong especially if you're paranoid about cps Mm -hmm. so there are a lot of reasons that fundies are scared of doctors but i wonder if the 
protocols could have been one factor in that. Like we were saying, I don't think that if something's just in the protocols, it's probably not Fundy related. But if it's in the protocols and then it's in John Todd, then there's a, a much greater chance. You know, you feel me? Yeah. Yeah. I just thought that fu- it, I just thought it was interesting given my Fundy experience. I mean, that that's definitely something that we should take a deeper look into. We like we're going to in the future. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the Fundy attitudes toward medicine and medical care. And that, that'll be a really interesting episode. Um, I want to move on to another quote here. Let's do it. Yeah. So this one seems especially relevant today with a lot of stuff. So this one says, uh, it, I think it's from Protocol 7. It says, the intensification of armament and the increase of the police force are essential to the re- realization of of the above mentioned plans it is necessary there should be besides ourselves in all countries only the mass of the proletariat and the few millionaires devoted to us policemen and soldiers we must create unrest dissensions and hatred throughout europe and throughout european affiliations also on other continents in this there is a twofold advantage First, we hold all countries under our influence since they will realize that we have the power to create disorders and to restore order whenever we wish. So what's your, what's your reaction to that section? So knowing what we know about the protocols, that they were plagiarized from a political work that was made in the 1800s and then modified to fit into the narrative that people were trying to push in early 1900s Russia. I tend to think that this may have been a softball prophecy to make the document seem legitimate. The prediction is pretty obvious like there's always going to be unrest and dissensions and hatred throughout european throughout europe and through european affiliations also on other continents that that's such a softball right. like there is always going to be unrest and dissension there is some right now like just in the last couple of years we've had brexit and now we have russia invading ukraine that's such a softball prediction i think whoever put this document together would have been able to see hey if i write this it's going to come true and it's going to make my document look super legitimate But it's also the explanation of specifically how this cabal is going to take over the world. And to legitimize this document further, that part of the plan would have to make sense. I see this going a couple of ways. One, you know, if you're a militia type, if you're a Sovsit type, you're going to be concerned about the militarization of police, especially after Waco, Ruby Ridge. You're seeing that and you're like, that could be me next. On the other hand... If you're a normie, there's a fairly decent chance that you're also concerned about the militarization of police with regards to them being mobilized to engage in violence against dissenters. But I've also seen prominent left-wing advocates and members of the government in this country uh, essentially invoke this exact trope to suggest that Jews or the Jewish state are directly responsible for the epidemic of police brutality that's going on in America. Well, I think that's why it made sense to have this section in the protocols, because remember, we know that this document was written on purpose to discredit and sow hatred of Jews, and then it was used in the same century to justify genocides as well as Lots and lots and lots of individual hate crimes. And whoever wrote it actually did that on purpose. They wanted to cause that harm. So their document needed to seem realistic if it was going to have the effect that they wanted it to have. So to me, it's it's like, yeah, of course, they included this because it's something that a lot of people across the political spectrum would already have fears about. Because they right. they wanted mm-hmm. to hurt people, and if they were going to accomplish that goal, this document had to appear very legitimate. Right. So you're taking a problem that exists, you know, no matter what. Like, because you know, I mean, we, American police don't need Jews to teach them how to be violent. <laughs> True That's, that. Yeah. That like that. I mean, that that makes. So you're taking a problem that already exists and that is systemic and has existed for a long time. And just also like insecurity within nations and you're blaming it on somebody that you don't like in perpetuity. Yeah. Well, it's like how um, there's a phrase in the book of Revelation where it says that one of the signs that Jesus is about to come back really soon is wars and rumors of wars. And then it also says that another sign that Uh, Jesus is about to come back real soon is earthquakes in diverse places. 
And if you if you look at like rapture prediction books, all of them are like, we got wars and rumors of wars going on. Jesus is coming back really soon. We've got earthquakes going on all over the world. Jesus is coming back really soon. And there have been wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in places <laughs> all the time, like consistently for the past roughly 2000 years since the book of revelation was written yeah but people will go like oh my god wars and rumors of wars jesus is coming back (laughs) and that's like that's what i get from the quote that you just read how has this manifested itself um at least in fundamentalism when you were growing up so in the mainstream i would point to fears about gun control I'm sure you'd be 0% surprised to find out that all of the IFB churches that I've ever known were strongly opposed to gun gun control, big NRA supporters. But I've talked before about the idea within the IFB that one day the government would come to take our Bibles and we'd better have guns to fight them off. And that's something that I see as strongly related to this idea. That's interesting. Yeah. So what are we going to talk about next? Because this is... we. I mean, if you're listening to this now, there's going to be a ton that's on the Patreon that you haven't even heard because we're going to have to make cuts. We're, this is just the longest conversation. Um, yeah. Do so, you want to move on to the next section? Yeah. So we talked about financial control. We talked about political control. Let's talk about some of the protocols surrounding free speech and freedom of the press. Uh, we're not going to have a whole lot of time to spend on this, but it is a major thing that we still see going around. So we'd be remiss not to talk about it. Well, the belief that Jews control the media and Jews control the press is pretty prevalent all like in modern culture anyway. Yeah, this is like a very real thing. So I don't want to skip over talking about it. Yeah. So uh, wh- why don't you take us through the first quote okay. that you want to go with? So this is pr- from Protocol 12. Let us return to the future of the press. Anybody who wishes to become an editor, a librarian, or a printer will be obliged to obtain a diploma, which in case of disobedience will be immediately revoked. So this is interesting to me because the basic fear of not being allowed to have free speech if you don't agree with the establishment, in this case, the coming Jewish super government, is something that I see everywhere. Talking about basic fears that could have originated with the protocols and then spread to millions of people, this is a big one. But what stands out to me is that this is something that has clearly not happened with podcasts and social media anyone can have a voice and anyone can earn a following like saying things that are extremely controversial doesn't negatively affect isn't going to prevent you from having a platform in in some cases it may help you have a platform is this the section though where you're you're going to warn us about the the jewish master plan to institute cancel culture Mm -hmm. this is that's what this sounds like (laughs) I don't get that so much. I get more that it's about forcing people to only get information from qualified sources when the definition of qualified is that they've been indoctrinated and approved by the establishment. So essentially, this this isn't uh, cancel culture is law now. It's uh, you're not allowed to, quote unquote, do your own research. Right. The protocols also talk about how they're going to gain control of every media outlet, how they're going to allow some dissenting voices to make it look like they don't have control just don't let this the dissenting voices get too out of hand which is interesting to me Hmm. so listen to this next section from protocol 12 when we reach the phase of the new regime which is transitory to our accession to power we must not allow the press to expose social corruption it must be thought that the new regime has satisfied everybody to such an extent that even criminality has stopped Cases of criminal activity must only be known to their victims or their accidental witnesses and to those alone. So this is another thing that can be shown not to have happened because of social media. And this is a thing that I don't think would be possible in the information age. Yeah, because this was written, what, before video cameras were invented. So I don't, I don't think they conceived a future in which every single person would be carrying around a video camera in their pocket and able to share whatever they're looking at and whatever they're seeing mm-hmm. with thousands or potentially millions of people just at a moment's notice. Yeah, I, I just I wanted to point out those two things that have not happened and are unlikely ever to happen, just in case anyone was getting a little bit nervous about uh, just in case anyone was getting a little bit nervous about, oh, well, some of these things kind of seem real. People who weren't raised with conspiracy theories being a major part of your life may or may not get this. And that's OK. 
but I feel like I can be I can be vulnerable to conspiracy theories even if I go in with the knowledge that they are not real and this is how they're not real. People who were raised like me, our brains were primed from childhood to read things like this and make connections to our real lives. We were trained to believe this kind of thing when we see it. So in case anyone was feeling like this text was feeling a little bit too real or that they were feeling that vulnerability, I thought it would be good to point out some places where it's objectively not coming true. I'm going to be honest with you, man. You remember a few months ago when we were talking about David Koresh and the Branch Davidians? Yeah. So when we did that episode, I had to watch a bunch of footage of him preaching and I kept thinking, dude, what if this guy's right? But, but like he that guy he's so convincing same with like john todd you know i i listened to so many like audio recordings of him you're thinking man this guy sounds really convincing but then you find out a, a few details that just totally discredit it and it's the same sort of thing with like the jack hiles door where jack hiles whole story like if you're just primed to believe him you're gonna believe him until you see the door and then the whole thing falls apart and yeah. I'm, I'm so glad it's not just me I, I no, want, it's not. yeah, like imagine how hard this is for, for people of us who were raised to eat this stuff up wherever we saw it. I think it's, it's really what helps me is finding those anchors that keep me grounded to reality because I can, I can look and objectively, apolitically, it is, it is just the truth that evidence of criminality being erased is not a thing that is going to be possible in the age of social media and in the age of everybody having a smartphone and uh, yeah. not being able to have a voice or a following if you're not approved by the establishment. I don't think that is going to be possible in the information age. I know that some people are still afraid of it. Like, afraid of getting deplatformed, like how Facebook will shut down anti vax groups. But the fact is that we still find those things on the internet. There are plenty of homes on the internet for misinformation and narratives that are outside the mainstream. So, it just, it just objectively, completely from an apolitical point of view, if this is starting to feel a little bit shaky, a little bit too real, we can look at those two things and go, oh, that's, that has not happened. That will never happen. And it can pull us back to reality. Go ahead. The fact that the protocols got printed and like widely distributed is proof that this isn't true because if the cabal were actually real oh, and that's, doing it, then they would have just that. they would have shut down like isn't the fact that this was widely distributed proof that it's fake to begin with because if they were actually in charge of everything who, like who's a uh, f***ing darren left the flyer <laughs> darren like left a copy of his book in the library or in a coffee shop or in the bar and then somebody got a hold of it and now they're making a bunch of copies of it and now it's every like f***ing darren yeah f darren I want to move. I want to move on to the next quote because it speaks specifically about an alleged plan okay. for indoctrination that is to take place at colleges and universities. Um, so it says, "For the purpose of destroying all collective forces except our own, we will nullify the universities. The first stage of collectivism." by reconstructing them along new lines. Their directors and professors will be trained for their work through detailed secret programs of action from which they will not be able to deviate in the least with impunity. They will be appointed with special care and will be so placed as to be completely dependent upon the government. We will exclude from the curriculum civic law as well as all that touches upon political questions. These subjects will be taught only to a few dozen selected for their striking ability from among the initiated. The universities must not allow callow youths to graduate who concoct plans for constructions as they do comedies or tragedies or who made with political matters, which even their fathers do not understand. Poorly directed study of political questions by a great number of people creates utopians and poor citizens. As you can judge by the universal education as conducted by the goys along those lines, it was necessary for us to infiltrate into their top educational system such principles as have been successfully broken down their social order. When we are in power, we will eliminate all disturbing subjects from educational systems and make young people obedient children of their superiors, loving and sovereign as the assurance of hope, peace, and quiet. 
Um, I don't know. I don't know if you want to go first on this one, or I don't know if you want me to. But I see some stark parallels between this and messaging that we're seeing coming out of like the right wing today with like LGBT stuff and like the critical yeah, race absolutely. theory and trying to ban that. And so this is something that I heard constantly growing up because public schools were a lesser evil to the greater evil of state universities. Hmm. I remember a lot of kind of cutesy phrases like Satan State University being thrown around a lot. So what did they tell you that the universities were teaching? All of the things that fundies are afraid of. So, you know, pushing the gay agenda, feminism, communism, warping your minds with just everything on the fundy hate list. We're going to have to do an entire episode about critical race theory at some point. This episode has been a lot of research, so I think we should recover from this one first. Yeah. But I think if we if we go down this rabbit trail, we're going to have a three hour episode on our hands again. Dude, we might already have a three hour episode on our hands. I'm going to have to make cuts. You can you can do it. You're a good editor. Okay. Well, <laughs> so we said that the protocols tend to fall into four categories. So financial and economic control, political control and one world government, control over free speech, the press and education, and then finally installing a one world ruler who will be the king of Israel and of the world. And we've we've worked our way through these the first three categories, and we've been pretty extensive on how we've covered them. And then we got to this last category and it kind of blew my mind. Really? <laughs> because it just I saw it gave me perspective over the entire thing. So we have a couple questions quotes about this that we want to get into this is the section that blew your mind this is the this is where it all started to make sense how this fits in with christian fundamentalism Hmm. uh the one of the quotes that i pulled about this this topic was after all is it not the same to the world who will be its master whether it be the head of head of catholicism or our despot of zionist blood to us however the chosen people it is by no means a matter of indifference do you want to read do you want to read that other quote that we pulled from this yeah, okay. So it's uh when the king of Israel places the crown offered to him by Europe on his sacred head, he will become the patriarch of the world. The necessary sacrifices made by him will never equal the number of victims sacrificed to the mania of greatness during the centuries of rivalry between the Goy governments. The king of Israel will become the real pope of the universe, the patriarch of the international church. But until we have accomplished the re-education of the youth to new transitional religions and finally to our own, we will not openly attack existing churches, but will fight them by means of criticism, thus creating dissension. So when I started reading through the protocols, I skimmed over the title of the book that they were printed in without giving it very much thought until I got all the way down to protocol 24. Which is the last one. Which is the last one, and that's the one that just blew my mind. What what jumped out at you? So Protocol 24, it has all these Christianese buzzwords. It's all talking about the King of Israel. And this has been, this concept has been mentioned throughout the protocols. The quotes that we just read were from number five, number 15, and number 17. It's been peppered in kind of throughout the whole document. But Protocol 24 is all about this King of Israel, this guy who is going to be chosen by the elders of Zion to be the ultimate ruler of the world. So after they've torn down other governments, governments, other religions, sown turmoil, brought financial havoc, and then taken over the world with their shadow government, the final step is to install a world ruler. This ruler will be trained by select men who are of, quote, the sacred seed of David. He will address the public often, and he will have three sponsors who will serve as his cabinet. What about this about seems so strange to you? They're very specific about the logistics of how this government is run, I think. like, I, 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 <laughs> So I can tell that you don't get it, but I think no. that a lot of our ex-fundy listeners are probably freaking out right now because this is all echoed from the Book of Revelations prophecies about the Antichrist. Okay. Yeah. No wonder I was like, I didn't notice I've never read Revelations. I've I've still never read it. It's been two years since we started the show. I haven't read it. It's pretty interesting. It's it's, it's one of the more interesting parts of the Bible if you're just going to sit and read through something. Well, the reason why why I haven't read it is because we're saving that for like content. We're saving Um, it for marriage. (laughs) 
So the thing about um, addressing the public often, that is from Book of Revelations. And so it's so the three sponsors, I immediately thought, oh, the Antichrist, the Beast and the False Prophet, which are which um, uh. <clears throat> it's all from from the interpretation of the Book of Revelation. That is that became popular in the 1850s <laughs> with through William Miller, which we talked about in the David Crash episode. So and, and you would have no idea. So this no. is when I read this and then I jumped back up to the top to see what the title of this book that the protocols were printed in was the title of this so this book that we read is by sergey nihilus and it is from 1905 i think it is the first time that the protocols were printed in full they were printed and they were printed in other places like in installments or partially the title is it is near at the door and the subtitle is near is the coming of the antichrist and the kingdom of the devil on earth of course, it is near at the door set off all kinds of alarm bells in my mind because it's a direct quote from the New Testament. The verse is in Matthew twenty four thirty three. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. It is a quote from a passage where Jesus is giving a prophecy about end times. And that passage is often used to clarify and prop up the book of Revelation as literal prophecy. So just for clarification, Sergey Sergey nihilist that the part that he wrote like his title and stuff that was added in later yeah yeah it's not yeah. a part of the protocols it is the title of the book in which the protocols were first published in full okay they were going they were being passed around as political literature like in pamphlets in russia and he was the first guy to take them all and put them all together and add commentary and publish it as like a proper book this is a guy he really buys into it and he really wants to get it out there he's like the alex jones of czarist russia yes (laughs) so like out of curiosity do you know what the russian orthodox view of book of revelations is because originally the protocols were published in russian for a russian audience and i know that the biblical literalist view of the book of revelations is largely an american thing so just from a quick Google, it looks like the Russian Orthodox Church fully rejects the rapture, but does believe in end times prophecy. So it generally believes that Revelations is a prophetic book, but members are strongly discouraged from trying to interpret the book on their own. So yeah, they do believe that the Antichrist is coming, that all of that is is fairly literal, but they don't encourage individual members to try to apply that to their daily lives or try to identify who the Antichrist is or speculate about current events being the fulfillment of that prophecy. They just more believe like, oh, it's going to happen eventually. So it's not like Brother Joseph Reed from First Baptist Church of Springfield reading the book of Revelations and then turning on the TV news looking for signs that the rapture is coming. No, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Christians are strongly discouraged from that. If somebody is reading the protocols, there's a decent chance they're at this point, in, at this time in history at least, there is a decent chance that they're reading them as part of one of this guy Sergei Nihilus's books. Definitely, because he was the first to put them all in a book as opposed to being published in part in like quotes from them, like little snippets being published in pamphlets or newspapers. So I found this quote from another one of Nihilus' books. So he he was the he got the protocols out there in book form and then he continued to give commentary on the protocols and how he believed that they were coming true politically for several years writing more books about it. So from a later book, he said, these protocols produced a scarcely noticeable impression upon the world outside of the Christian church. The periodical press, which in the main is in Jewish hands or under the guidance and influence of the Jews, sought to conceal their publication, scarcely mentioning them or referring to them as a fallacious invention or a fairy tale. Among loyal Christians, however, the protocols bore fruit and created a success for my book far greater than could have been anticipated, for they spread the knowledge of the hidden mysteries of our time in a wide circle of those belonging to the Christian family. So Nihilus basically says only Christians will get this. Right here, this is evidence of the early link between Christianity and the protocols. Yes, 
but I think it's also the connection between QAnon and the evangelical right. Mm. I think a lot of us have asked ourselves, and a lot of journalists have asked, why do these two groups have so much overlap? Like, we know that the evangelical right is very into conspiracy theories. We know that they are used to taking things on faith, and that when Q asks for faith and quotes scripture, that that's appealing. We know that QAnon tends to blame groups of people that they already don't like for things that they already don't like. So it's appealing. But evangelical Christians are also generally very pro-Jewish, even to the point of cultural appropriation, pro-Israel, pro-Zionist. And QAnon has predictably swerved into anti-Semitic territory many times because it's a direct descendant of the protocols. So how can evangelicals support QAnon. And this question has been asked over and over. And I think that that I ran into something that that journalists are missing when they talk about this. What that basically this protocols thing was written for a Christian audience. And that it fits with revelation. That's the thing. Because I I, I will link quite a few articles as additional reading in my sources for this episode where you can see journalists hit some of these points. Q quotes scripture. That makes them more likely to believe it. Q kind of name drops Christian ideologies and, and uses Christian buzzwords. Q asks for faith. They're used to giving faith. Evangelicals are prone to conspiracy theories. Q blames the things they don't like on the people they don't like. But the thing that I haven't seen mentioned in these articles is the connection to the book of Revelation. And I think that that is maybe a key that people aren't seeing. Wow. I think that is because the idea, the the book of Revelation connects to all of these conspiracy theories and connects into the protocols. If you read both of them just right and kind of squint a little bit, they fit into each other so well. So if you already believe the book of Revelations, if somebody comes out with a conspiracy theory that sounds a whole lot like the book of Revelations, you're going to think this is like this is happening. This is for real yeah i think that this is this is the the axis that the evangelical acceptance of QAnon turns on yeah i'm not saying that other people are wrong when they find these other reasons that it makes sense for evangelicals to accept QAnon, but i think they're missing the the thing at the middle of the wheel of all the reasons so I made a joke when we did our John Todd episode. I was like, if uh, the book of Revelations is a coded political message, does that make it the original QAnon? And... Yeah, well, yeah, maybe. You said it wasn't um, for a probably legitimate reason. I don't know. I haven't read it. Revelation was somewhat... Pro- I the Where I have landed for the moment, Revelation was prophecy, but it has already been fulfilled. Like, the John, the writer of Revelation, was writing it um, around 100 AD-ish, uh, between 70 and 100 AD is when I believe the book of Revelation was supposedly, supposedly written. He was writing about things that happened in the 150 to 200 years after his death, maybe 300 years. And, and like, it was prophecy and like, like, you know, you could write something now about what's going to happen in the next 150 to 200 years in America and you might be right. And, you know, you can say, oh, that knowledge came from God. Or you can say, well, that knowledge came because this person who wrote this was a student of history and made some real good guesses. And who knows? But I, I think that it was prophetic or a good guess one way or the other. And that those things, for the most part, came true in the immediate couple hundred years after John's death. Interesting. That's where I am at the moment. Could totally change again. The idea of the government being taken over by the Antichrist is a very big feature in the book of Revelation. And the fact that the protocols are so closely related to the idea of an Antichrist would Uh. really set up... Christians who believe in a literal view of Revelation to be very about the protocols and other conspiracy theories that spring from them. So I generally like to believe the best in people when I can. I know that on this show, we don't often give the IFB a lot of credit, but I like to think that if you showed the average 
IFB person, the average uh, fundy, this document, you told them what it was, you told them why it was written, and they would say, this is some nonsense. How dare they pervert my deeply held religious beliefs and religious convictions to sow hate against the Jews in Israel? Yes, I, I agree. I think that an average IFB person would be horrified to find out that their pet conspiracy theories came from or were heavily influenced by a document that was responsible for the deaths of millions of people in general, but especially millions of Jews. Anything, this just shows us how crucial it is for a John Todd or a Jack Chick to take the conspiracy to lift bits from it, like almost word for word almost complete plagiarism then do kind of like a find and replace with the word jews and change it to illuminati or change like jewish religion to zionism or jewish religion and change it to witchcraft or a cult or something and yeah i think we're seeing the protocols as a historic document and then there are two shifts in thinking that make it acceptable in the form of QAnon to American Christians. And that first shift is correlating the protocols with the American view of the Book of Revelation. And then the second shift is where John Todd and Jack Jack Chick obfuscated the origins of it as a hateful document against Jews and made it hateful against somebody that American Christians were much more willing to hate openly. Yeah, so liberals, but also secretly Jews. Uh, <laughs> Liberal witches, but yeah, secretly um, liberals and also secretly Jews. Yeah, but I feel like whoever those... You hate. Whoever you hate, whoever, the ones yeah, whoever who it is you don't us. like, yeah. mostly Satanists and, mm-hmm. and Jews, Satanists. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that we're seeing those two crucial shifts that when the protocols turned into QAnon, if those two shifts hadn't happened, I think that American Christians wouldn't be so attracted to QAnon. So this this is how John T- John Todd and Jack Chick are responsible. It's not like they came up with QAnon, but it's how they transformed the protocols down the line into a version that was ready for Christians to fall into it. So after reading this, do you understand why I think that all populists are anti-Semites, even if they don't know they are? Yeah, I I, I get it, and I'm I'm glad we kind of worked all of that out. Yeah, that was that was a worthwhile conversation for me. Yeah, and this is sort of the thing I, I think a lot of people are resistant to, like because so many of these conspiracies that we talked about, um, so many of the elements at least, you know, they're just so ingrained and ubiquitous in our society. Like if you ask a fish if water is wet, they're not going to be able to tell you. It's just the same. So like when you tell people, you know, if if you go and say to somebody uh, or if we were going to go and say to somebody, uh, you're raised in a racist society and you need to unlearn all of the things that you absorbed without meaning to absorb. Some people will be understanding. Some people won't. Some like generally speaking, like left wing people will be more understanding than right wing people if you if you tell them that sort of thing but if you do the same sort of thing and you're and you tell somebody by the way when you talk about the illuminati you're alleging grand conspiracies and uses and like if you're alleging grand conspiracies and using phrases like the global elite like and and you tell them where that comes from and you tell them that it's anti-semitic to say it they'll treat you like a villain um they'll treat you like you're like being a bootlicker or like an apologist to corrupt oligarchs or billionaires or you know whoever they're the people in is that they're blaming that isn't actually the Jews, but you know, they'll treat you like you're an enemy of the people. It's another form of black and white thinking. And I think Yeah. Well we have to we have to navigate that because you don't want to say, oh well, you know, the people who are societally extremely privileged and trample all over people who don't have the same privilege that they do it's like people i mean people like jeff bezos who were born into a wealthy family and got a lot of help founding his company and now he has a company and treats his workers extremely poorly with no regard for how much he was given in life how do you how do you hate him without falling into this conspiracy theory it's it's treacherous waters to navigate yeah. It's very interesting, though, to see that parallel to Christians who would say, 
like people who are are very liberal but if you let them know that hey this part of your philosophy came from an anti-semitic thing you should probably dig into that they will get really mad it, that is very parallel to me to christians who would say they're 100 percent pro-jewish you know they've got an israel flag hanging up in their church but they're spouting the same conspiracy theories that that parallel is really striking to me it's I, it's in vogue to invoke nazism when you're talking about whoever your political enemies are right now but i i've noticed this maybe it's just because i hang out with more left-wing people than right-wing people but i notice that when left when people are invoking Nazism when they're talking about the far right. Not to say that Nazi sympathism sympathizerism doesn't exist in like very serious way in a lot of those like extreme right wing spaces, but then they'll just go out and use the exact same buzzwords and controversy and like conspiracies that originate in this document while like accusing their political enemies of being Nazis. It's Somewhat really infuriate. something. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is to me we know the whole document is a forgery. It's plagiarized, but it's mind blowing to see how it affected the world so much. It was written to justify pogroms in Russia, it was written for a specific political purpose, but the ideas were infectious and spread probably far beyond what the people who made it would ever have expected. Just like the Playboy Illuminati letters, regardless of the writer's intentions, which were probably just mischief and not evil, it became so much more than the writers could have ever anticipated. So now we're at the point where a hundred year old document written for the Russian political revolution in the 1900s is influencing both right wing and left wing Facebook posts in 2022. Yeah. Like I said, the truest example of horseshoe theory is when it comes to anti-Semitism. Of course, one of the biggest dis uh, detractions from horseshoe theory is how much people on both ends of the horseshoe hate being associated with each other. <laughs> so I want to I want to wrap this one up with providing a little bit of an antidote. Just what has helped me get over this thing? thinking because the idea of the global elites or the Satanists or the Jews or the Illuminati or whoever it is that you're hating on running everything, like you said, that idea is so prevalent that it seems to come from everywhere and dismantling it is really scary because better the devil you know than the devil you don't, right? I, I think that taking apart that idea is is was pretty scary for me. What I really did come to believe personally is that of course, there are people at the top, not the top as in control, but the top as in they've got more money and power than I've got. People like Bezos or Zuckerberg or the DeVos family, there are absolutely people who have money and power and reach that are outside the wildest dreams of people like you and me. And of course, there are strategic alliances and friendships between some of those people and others of those people. If you were super rich, would you be hanging out with you or would you be hanging out with other super rich people? I'd probably be hanging out with you. Well, if, if you were super rich, I'd also be super rich because we have the same job. That's true. Please so. help us get super rich. If you want to give us, if you want to give us a billion dollars, please. If you do. give us a billion dollars, we will give you access to everything that we have ever recorded. <laughs> So, of course, there are strategic alliances and friendships between some of those people with money and power and reach and others of them. But what saves me from the idea that these people are all a formalized cabal who are trying to take over the world in a formal way is the idea of human selfishness. All of those people are individuals who are trying to get ahead and trying to do what's best for them. They like their giant houses and their expensive clothes and their fancy cars and having the security that they will always have access to those things. If what's best for them is also best for their rich and powerful friends, they're going to do that. But if it's if what's best for them is just what's best for them, they're also going to do that thing. It's that the idea of selfishness is like a it's like an antidote to me from the idea that they are all in it together to get me personally. I think deconstructing the idea that some force of elite humans run the world scared me because I was so used to that idea. And without that idea, the world seemed directionless. When I started deconstructing these conspiracy theories in my mind, I had to face the reality that maybe no one is running the show. 
Like maybe we're all just hurtling through space in no particular direction. And that's terrifying. If you come from a background like I do, where you're conditioned to believe that there is a group of people running everything, even if they're evil, it's easier to believe that your decisions and your future are influenced by a shadowy group of elites because at least somebody's running the thing. Thinking like, oh, maybe nobody is actually running the entire world scared the shit out of me. But the pragmatism of humans are going to human, it's going to happen, I'm responsible for what I can control, has helped me get over that fear and allowed me to at least entertain the idea of a world that is not run by a shadowy group of elites. Isn't one of the major reasons why people turn to religion to look for direction within the chaos, though? Yeah, I think it absolutely is. And religion is one of several things that helps me deal with the perceived chaos of the world. So I find it personally a bit ironic that religion is largely popular because it provides direction within basically the chaotic, mad world that we live in. But then religion is also cannibalized to turn the madness into something nefarious and systemic and intentional. Well, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. But like I was saying, humans going to human. That's what they're going to do. Yeah. So uh, we're going to get into more of my view of humanity at some point, but that's the teaser trailer for it. I think that people have the innate desire to do good, but humans also have innate selfishness. Mm -hmm. Also, don't write massive conspiracy theories because they might be used to justify murdering people hundreds of years after you're dead. Anyway, th this episode is over now. Uh, thank you for <laughs> tuning in. It's over. Uh, follow our podcast on Facebook, Instagram at Leaving Eden Podcast on Twitter at Leaving Eden Pod. Join our Facebook group. Join our subreddit give us money on patreon if you want to hear a version of this episode that's like three and a half hours long join our patreon because that's legit what it's going to be sadie do you want to plug your social media yeah if for some reason you want to hear another word from me in my life you can follow me on instagram at sadie carpenter music you can follow me on twitter at helia sadie and on tiktok at sadie carpenter one and you can follow me on facebook instagram and twitter at g-a-v-r-i-e-l-h-a-c-o-h-e-n thank you so much for tuning in good night